the video. I, I kind of missed that earlier. I think it's important to recognize. Um, it, it's it's cool that you liked it, right? This is. Um, are, are, are we are we short of machine? Recognize like why you why you liked it. Um, a portion of you probably liked it because it was your opportunity to do something in 2D animation um, or something in 2D. Right? 3D is just not like you're not digging that just yet. Give it time, you may change your mind on it. You may start to love the 3D part of it. But these last two exercises, I kind of gave you the opportunity to play around in some 2D. If you're enjoying that, there's more opportunities to do 2D in the animation concentration later, but recognize that it is, just like the industry, it is heavily moving toward 3D, right? Um, we have much more um, 3D animation in this concentration than we do in, uh, in 2D animation. Doesn't mean we don't graduate people who, um, who are doing 2D animation. Um, I have a couple of people, uh, uh, Brett Ackley um, is working um, in 2D animation, Ryan Brown is working in 2D animation. Ryan Brown did an internship um, um, with Cartoon Network on Adventure Time. So it is possible, but if you're really liking the 2D part of it, the opportunity to do more 2D work is probably going to happen in the visualization concentration. So you have to kind of weigh that. Do you, if you hate the 3D part of it, then maybe the animation concentration is going to fight you more and not give you the opportunities to do the parts you want. What you can consider doing is taking visualization and doing your electives as animation classes, right? Um, taking animation fundamentals, taking character animation, and not taking all of those 3D classes, like 3D animation, that you might not like. I'm kind of working to make the animation concentration more 2D friendly, but changes at the university level are slow. Like it's, it's not like I can be like, hey, we need a 2D class. I'm going to hit the new class button, and suddenly it's there. Like to get a new class implemented takes um, at a minimum probably a year, right? So I'm, I'm starting the process of getting a, a 2D animation class, hopefully on the books before too long. Um, in the meantime, what I usually do is I teach that 2D animation class um, every other summer. Um, so probably not this coming summer, but um, at least the next summer. It, it, may, it may be this coming summer if I have enough interest in it. Um, I'll offer a 2D animation class over the summer. In the meantime, I have a lot of the uh, class footage from, from last 2D animation class on that same YouTube page. So if this is something you're digging, Spend some time and, and play with it. Like find the thing that is you're liking and do more of it. Right? Some of you may have liked this project because um, I took some of the technical barriers out of your way. Right? How many of you used um, Piscal? Do this. Right? Um, of those people who used Piscal, how many of you had used it before? So that means everybody else who raised their hand, right? That was your first time using it, and it did not take you very long to figure out how to use it, right? So you were able to go from not knowing how to use that software to being able to get some form of result that made you happy without a huge learning curve, right? You didn't have to spend days and days and days remembering shortcut keys and learning the interface and learning how to navigate you were able to figure it out pretty quickly. And because of that, you were able to see results that probably made you feel good about your work, right? But that's a good thing. That's how art works, right? Um, very early on, we learned, hey, if I draw this weird blobby shape on this piece of paper and I hand it to mom, mom goes, oh, that's so pretty. Let's hang it on the refrigerator. That's a nice elephant. You're like, it's not an elephant. And you're like, 
just like, what is it, man? Like, yeah, so you, you remember that, but that was a positive feedback loop, right? You, um, you, you did something, you felt good about that result. Maya is slower on that, right? Like, probably what you're feeling with Maya is, I'm constantly fighting with it, and I'm not seeing anything good come out of it, right? That's like, ugh. This is not like this does not look like um, Inside Out. This does not look like a good dinosaur. This does not look like Wreck It Ralph. Um, I, you're seeing those things, and, and it's not giving you enough of that feedback loop. Um, however, this goal was easy, right? You, it, you you were able to click some stuff, and you started seeing things move, and you went, "Ooh, that feels neat. I'm going to do some more of that," right? So I. I, I want to kind of acknowledge that Maya eventually gets to that point, but in the early stages, it's very frustrating, right? Um, and that's one of the things we're addressing today, is that we went through multiple weeks of you fighting with Maya, and you all got something out of it for your project one, but when I asked you if you were happy with it, usually the results I get from that answer are like, eh, like a lukewarm. Um, when I ask you, did you enjoy it? Like, eh, everything except, right? Um, and that's fine. Like, that's how you should feel right now, right? What I want to tell you is that it gets, it gets easier. It gets better. Um, because eventually Maya just becomes a pencil, right? Maya just becomes a tool that you don't even think about. It's a really hard class for me to teach because it, but Maya is so intuitive to me now that I forget how I do things. I just do them, right? Like I, I, I had to stop and remember, I have to do it every semester, I have to stop and remember which one tumbles, which one zooms, which one pans, right? I alt, right, left, middle click. Which one does that? I, I forget um, because I do it automatically, right? If I just sit down at your computer, I immediately start, my hands just start doing it, right? I don't have to remember that anymore, any more than you have to remember how to use the steering wheel or the gas pedal when you're driving into work, right? Or driving into class. So these things um, become intuitive, and then Maya feels much more like using Piscal did, right? Um, it's that you just sit down and you start clicking buttons and you start seeing results that you wanted to see, right? So we're gonna address some of those challenges one at a time today. Ha um, hopefully most of you are enjoying the making things move part of this, right? Um, today we're going to make some stuff move, um, and we're going to do it in a very specific way. So um, I am uh, also casting through WebEx, if you want to pull up the WebEx app. Um, again, for those of you who don't remember where that's at, um, it's under the Greg tab, this WebEx thing here. This will allow you to see what's on my screen, on your screen, that way you can kind of not have to look up and down so much. And again, I'm recording. So I would go ahead and open Maya. But recognize that what we're doing in class today, I'm not going to ask to see later, right? Um, this is, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna follow along, it's just so you can learn those buttons, just so you can try the things I'm trying. Um, I would encourage you to go ahead and try it as I go along um, and ask questions when you get lost on stuff. Like there's, it's, it's always very um, uh, kind of frustrating when like, I think everybody's, like following along, and then somebody asks a question at the end of the lecture. Uh, I missed that very first part. Could you teach that whole class again? Uh, and I'm like, stop me when you have the problem, and I can fix it then usually really easily, and you can and kind of keep up. But if at any time you're like, I don't want to keep up, I just want to listen and see what he's talking about. You learn the way you want to learn, okay? To follow along with this, though, we're going to make a couple of objects, and we're going to shift into a different view, okay? So right now I'm looking at Maya in the perspective view, right? Um, I'm just gonna create a box right there. And if you wanna create one too, that's cool. You can make it whatever object you want to, but a box works pretty well for me. Um, I wanna see this from a side view, okay? So um, there's a couple of ways I can do that. Right now, I am in my perspective camera. If I tap the space bar, I go to all four of my views here, right? So this is my perspective, top, front, side. I can choose either of these that I want to use. Um, the other way I can do this is if I hold down the space bar here, 
and click on the word Maya, it lets me choose views there. Um, and then the other way I can do this is if I go to panels, right now I can choose my perspective camera from there, but if I go to orthographic, I could choose my front camera. So I'm just going to use my space bar and I'm going to go to my front camera. And I'm just going to animate in this camera just so we can kind of clearly see what's happening. Okay. So I'm going to hit um, W to kind of move this over to here. Right. And then I need, let's say, three or four more of these. How, um, how do I get a duplicate of this box? Control D, right? Now, I want to point out what happens with Control-D. Um, if I open my outliner, you'll see I have P-Cube 1. And if I hit Control-D, it just makes another one just like it. right? And then I can move that over. Okay? Um, now, what some of you are in the habit of doing is Control-C and then Control-V. Now, watch what happens when I hit Control-V it made something that looks different, right? It made a group, and under that group is this terribly named pasted P cube 2, right? That's why we use control D, is because this will get very messy very quickly. Um, so again, just my, my preference uh, for cleanliness reasons, control D instead of control uh, C and V. So control D duplicates. And so I'm just going to go ahead and make like, I'm going to sort of spread them out just a little bit here. Go ahead and make like four boxes. Okay. Now I'm also going to go ahead and make a cone. This thing here. All right. So it's a polygon cone. If I click that, it made it right there in the center. I'm just going to move it over here to this side. Hold E and rotate it. Now, if I wanted to get it perfectly straight, I can sit here and finagle with it forever, or I can just go over here and type 90. Oh, got a hit number lock for it. 90, right? Um, and so now it's pointed in that direction. I'm also going to go ahead and scale it a little bit um, just to make it a little bit smaller. Right. So. This is all you need for this exercise. Um, and hopefully, like, uh, those, those tasks I just took, um, hopefully those weren't too hard for you. Right? If, you if you decided you, you wanted to do this along with me, most of you were probably pretty comfortable repeating those tasks. Right? Um, we've already learned how to move some stuff around when we were, when we were modeling our bridge. Um, we learned how to duplicate stuff. We learned how to scale and rotate stuff. We've actually gone well beyond that. So what I would like to point out to you is that creating this scene used all of the same skills that creating the bridge at the beginning of this class used. It was just easier for you this time, right? Um, and that's going to continue to get easier. Like what I'm going to do today may seem like a challenge to you right now. Um, people who animate for um, a couple of months, what I do today is not particularly challenging. So, we're going to start off the way we did um, on class one, right? Or, not, uh, yeah, class, I guess it was class three, when we animated that car driving across the bridge, right? I want my um, arrow here, my, my cone, um, I want it to go from one side of the screen to the other, okay? So, I'm going to select it. I'm on frame one. How do I set a keyframe? S. S. So S sets a keyframe on frame one for my object to be in that spot. Right? And I know that I'm kind of repeating myself on some of this stuff, but I feel like it's worth it. When I hit S, all I'm doing is telling Maya, whenever I'm on frame one, right, whenever my, my time slider here is on frame one, I want these values in my channel box to be that, right? They're like, those sets of values always result in my cone being exactly where it's at right now, right? 
if any of those values change, it's in a different spot. If my rotation changes, it's, it's twisted a little bit. If my translations change, it's in a different location. So basically what I did is I kind of made a bookmark, right? I, I, I made a, a reminder for Maya, whenever we're on frame one, set all of those values to that location, right? So let's, let's create another keyframe. Um, I'm going to go to the end of my timeline. Mine is set to 120. Yours doesn't have to be, but I want to go ahead and do that. And I'm going to move it all the way to the end. Right. Now, what happens if I move my time slider right now? It's just going to snap back, right? Why? Yeah, I haven't added another bookmark. Right. Um, if you if you're reading your book and you have like those little, um, let's say you're studying for a, a history test, right? You have those little bitty like tabs you put all over every page. You know what I'm talking about? Those little sticky note tabs, right? Um, and then you have your bookmark for where you are for reading. If you lose that bookmark, like you have to find that page again, right? So this keyframe is kind of like a bookmark for this new location when I'm on frame 120, right? So I'm going to go ahead and hit S there. Well, before that, I'll, I'll just show you. If I, if I move my frame, it's just going to snap back to the last keyframe I defined, right? So um, the way I mark that, is I hit S again. Now, I personally like using auto key. Um, you're going to have some issues with auto key later. Um, I'll bring auto key back up in just a second, but if you use auto key, that basically means um, it's going to automatically try to set keyframes when you change things, right? Some people don't like that because they forget auto keys on and they set a whole bunch of keyframes they didn't mean to set. Some people like it because auto key saves them time and they don't lose keyframes they meant to set, right? Um, so it's your call, um, and I'll show you a little bit more about auto key as we go. But I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And when, when you hit play, you're probably going to get the same thing I am, right? Look at that thing. It's moving so fast, right? Is that the actual time of this animation? It's not. Um, but how do we know? It's moving really fast, right? But, I mean, maybe I want it to move really fast. Um, one of the ways to look is to look at our timeline, right? Maya is always going to play our animation back at 24 frames a second, okay? People get confused about what that means. Um, and if you're not one of those people, like, bear with me on this, because a lot of people do. They think, oh, I need my animation to go faster. I need to change my frame rate. That's not an option. Like film that you see in the theater is always playing back at 24 images in a second, right? If they need Iron Man to go faster, they don't slow down the projector, right? It's always flashing those 24 frames. Um, so right now what's happening though is the reason it's playing at this fast, right? You can tell it's playing more than 24 frames in a second, right? It's playing all the way to the end in less than a second, and I have 120 frames in here. So that means it's playing like 120 frames a second. The reason it's doing that is because of a setting I have turned on. And I know we've already talked about this, but it's worth reiterating. Right click here, go to playback speed, and you'll see that what it's set to right now is play every frame free, right? What that means is Maya is using the resources from my computer to play back every frame of this animation um, as fast as the computer can play it, right? If I had a super complex scene in here, it may be trying to play it at two frames a second, right? If I, but I have a really simple scene, Maya is able to play this really fast, so it's just flying, right? I wanna see it always playing back at the accurate speed of the animation. So I need to set this to real time. So now when we watch this, this is the speed of my animation, okay? Um, I, just before I move on, why would Maya ever want to play every frame? Like, wh why, why would that be set on automatically? Anybody have any ideas? Okay. 
Because some things require Maya to know what happened on frame 10 before it can interpret what should happen on frame 11. Okay? Um, and so we're going to see this in a, a good example of this is like a water simulation, right? So not necessarily that, that ripple, that boss water you had before, although that does kind of require that. Um, let's say if I'm pouring water out of a cup, right? Um, that is a very like procedural physics calculation that happens one frame at a time. And so if it skips any frames because it's trying to play it at real time, it's going to mess up that simulation. Okay. So there's, there are times when we need to switch this back and forth. On project three, we'll have to switch this back to play it at real, um, uh, play every frame instead of real time, right? Um, but we'll go back and forth. Recognize that if you want to see the actual speed of the animation, it needs to be set to real time. So now my arrow is traveling from one side of the screen to the other, and it's traveling pretty slowly, right? What if I wanted that to travel faster? How would I make this travel faster? I think I, think I heard some kind of answers there. What, what was the... If the frames were closer. If the frames were closer. So why... That, that's like, that makes sense to a lot of people. They're like, oh, okay, I get it. But let's sort of break that down a little bit. Why does that make it faster? Because it gives it less time to do from one side to the other. Right, right. It takes few, because frames are always going to be playing in 24 frames a second, right? So if I want to add, if I want that object to travel from side one, or from, from the beginning to the end in one second, I need that to happen in 24 frames, right? Um, if I wanted it to take two hours, right, then I need a ton of frames, right? Um, and so it's the number of these frames apart that these keyframes are that controls the timing. The fewer frames that it takes for an action to happen, the faster that animation is going to appear or uh, seem to be. We learned this probably in our flip book, and we probably learned this in the GIF as well, right? Some of you are like, I'm going to have my character run across the screen um, in these 50, 50 flip book pages, right? And you did that, and then when you started flipping through it, it's like, wow, he doesn't look like he's running at all. He looks like he's in slow motion, right? Or maybe the GIF. Maybe you're like, I need this ball to bounce up and down. Um, maybe, you know, at the top, it just takes one frame to go to the, the bottom, right? And when you watch that in your GIF, it's just flickering, right? So you, you learn timing a little bit as you go. Um, but it's actually pretty easy. It's the distance between your keyframes on your timeline is how we change how fast this goes. So if I wanted this to get to the other side faster, all I have to do, I'm going to hit stop here. Can you see my keyframe down there? Yeah, it's really faint. So that little red keyframe right there, that little red dot, I have one down here too, right? I just need those to be closer together on my timeline. I need them to take fewer frames to go from frame A to frame B. Now, to change that, all I have to do is hit Shift and click on my timeline, right? And, and this is how I select ranges of my timeline. So if I hold Shift and click, it kind of highlights that whole section in red, and then I can drag this earlier. So if I wanted this to happen in 40 frames, now when I play that, my animation is much faster, right? Um, if I wanted it to happen super fast, move it down here to 10 frames, right? And now my animation is extremely fast, right? Um, So this is how we adjust our time. I'm going to go ahead and give me a, a reasonable amount of time. Let's say, let's see what 80 frames look like. Sure. Um, that looks okay. Now, if I have 80 frames, let's say I want less like right now, my, my animation ends on frame 80, 
but my timeline still goes out to frame 120. Let's say I want my timeline to end at frame 100 or at 80 instead of 120. Um, that's what these numbers here in this little box here is for, right? I can slide my timeline around, um, but these numbers at the beginning and end will change that. So 200 is the maximum range of my timeline right now. This is as big as I can scale it. I can set that to 10,000, right, and like make this enormous timeline. Um, I don't really want to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and set it to 80. And that way it ends right there. This number on the inside is the viewable range right now, right? So if I scale this in and I only want to look at frames 49 through 58, you'll see 49 and 58, right? So let's go ahead and set that to 1 and 80 as well. Now, I can always change this at any point. This is just for convenience of my um, viewing of the viewport here, right? Or of the, uh, the timeline. So, last thing here um, before, I, before I move on. What if I'm unhappy with this keyframe? What if I'm like, oh, I wanted it to go just a little bit further? How do I, how do I change that keyframe? Well, I can move it, but like, what if I just wanted to change like where the actual arrow is in the scene? What if I wanted it to move further past that point? Right. So I can I can always change that. I can move where it is right here. But if I move my timeline, I already set that keyframe there, so it's going to snap back, right? But as long as my timeline is on top of there, and I scale this out or move that out, and I hit S again, it's just, oh, it's just going to copy over my previous key. Right? And so now that's where it ends. Right? So I wanted to show you that you can change keyframes after you've made them. If you need to delete a keyframe for any reason, you right click on your timeline and hit delete. Okay. We can also copy and paste keyframes in here. Do not use control C and control V. We use this copy and paste, right? So sort of the elephant in the room is the fact that I have this arrow doing a bunch of impossible things, right? It's passing through other objects, which is impossible. Like we, we know that just from the natural world, Ob two objects cannot occupy the same space, right? Um, So I'm going to make this animation. I'm going to make my um, arrow sort of zigzag through this. Okay? How do I do that? Like I want it to be like one of those obstacle course cone things where it's like, you know, driving through an obstacle course. What do I need to do to make that happen? So I need to set more keyframes, right? It's important to remember that Maya is not an animator. You are an animator. You are the one controlling this, right? So whenever the computer needs more information, it's like not going to come up with it. It's going to ask me, right? I, I'm the one who can control this. So you probably have already seen, right? I can, um, I can go anywhere I want to in here in the middle Right? And I can move this however I want to move it, change any of these values in here, right? Um, and if I hit S, that's a new keyframe. Maya's going to try to transition from here to here to here. And it's going to do its best to fill in all of those other gaps, right? So if I hit play, I get that. And that's not really what I wanted, right, obviously. So I'm just going to delete that keyframe. So my job is to try to guide my, um, my arrow through this obstacle course. So I'm going to get to here and realize, ah, it's going through that. Um, I want to take it either under or over it. Which, which, which one do you want me to do, over or under? <laughs> All right, I'll be the deciding vote. Uh, <laughs> let's go under. Um, so around frame 21 seems to be where it's like passing through it, right? 
21, 22. So I'm going to go ahead and move the arrow down to here around that frame, right? So around frame 22, I want it to be under here instead of in the middle of it. And so I'm going to hit S to set that keyframe. And what you're going to see is now it goes around that one, right? But it's still going to mess up through all these others, not just going underneath the entire thing, right? So maybe right here, um, when it's right at the same like uh, horizontal location as my second box, I want it to be over it. Maybe we'll move it forward a little bit more, right? And so now we're going to start seeing that this arrow is kind of zigzagging through this scene, right? Something like this. Um, maybe right here. Um, I go over it again. And I'm just moving it and hitting S, right? And so now when I hit play, it does that. Now it's important to recognize that when I hit S, it is setting a keyframe on all of my channels, right? Every, every translate, rotate, scale, visibility, all of those things are getting a keyframe on them. They're all turning red, right? We're seeing it in our timeline just as a single red dash, but that really means that what we got was 10 different keyframes for each of these little red dashes on there. That's not always the truth, right? If I just wanted to keyframe one attribute, right? Um, we can see in here when there's a keyframe on our channel or not, right? I'm on frame 14, it's, it's this pink color, meaning it's animated, but it's not got any red dots. Versus frame 22, where everything is red, right? Now, if I wanted to adjust one channel, right, let's say I wanted to adjust just my translate Y, right, I wanted to move it up, I could always right click on translate Y and say key selected, right? Now, there's only a keyframe on my Translate Y, but on my timeline, it looks just like any of those other keyframes. Um, this is not necessarily a good practice. And the reason for that is because I don't know how previous or next keyframes are going to alter that keyframe I just set, right? So for example, like right now, um, I did not set any keyframes key on my Translate X, right, on this frame. But I did on the frames before and after it, right? So if I change my Translate X here, well, let me show you. On this one where I only set it on Translate Y, it's not inside of the box, right? It's still before the box. If I go to my next uh, keyframe here and I change it, something like this, right, then now my previous keyframe let me try that again, something a little less extreme maybe. Now that previous keyframe is there, right? And that's because Maya is just trying to figure out all those keyframes in between and I didn't tell it where to be on Translate X and Z and all that other stuff. So um, just my habit is to try to key everything. Um, so, undo, so I undid all of that, so now that keyframe isn't there anymore. Um, and we still have that same zigzaggy, right? Now, in terms of my animation, um, this isn't, it's still not very good, right? A couple of things I wanted to address. One of them is, I feel like there's a little bit too much, um, like it's kind of going fast in the middle, and then it gets to the end right here, and then that ending part is really kind of slow, right? And so again, this is all in timing. If I, if I look at my key ticks here, I got this big gap between my first two keyframes, and I got this big gap between my second two keyframes. Right? Well, since I've nailed everything down, that means I can kind of scale those keyframes in the middle. Can you all see the keyframes on here? It's very, it's very faint, I know that. But um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make a change to my interface just so you can see it a little more clearly. Um, you're always welcome to do this under Windows, Settings and Preferences, Preferences, uh, I think it's under um, Timeline or Time Slider right here. 
Um, I'm going to make my key tick sizes bigger just so you can see them. So you see them now, they're like darker red. And I'm also going to make my timeline a little taller. So just so you can see it, right? This is something I actually do when I'm working just so I have more room in my timeline to work. Right now I'm just doing it so you can see it better, right? Um, it didn't change how it works or anything, but now hopefully you can see those key ticks a little better. So I have this big gap in between these first two keyframes, and I have a pretty big gap between these second two keyframes. If I want that little stretch right there to happen faster, I just need that gap to be smaller, right? So I can very easily go in here and adjust when each of these keyframes happen. All right, I can do like this. And so now you'll see that the end doesn't have quite so much lead in time to it, right? I want to undo that because there's another way I can do this as well, which is if I hold shift and highlight this whole range here, you'll notice a couple of things. I have a couple of arrows in this highlighted range. I have these two arrows that are in the middle, right? See them right there. And then I have the arrows that are on each end here and here, right? Those are going to allow me to scale and move my entire um, selection of keyframes, right? So if I click this, these middle buttons here, I can slide all of this earlier, right? I can make that animation start earlier and it has this huge amount of time at the end, right? So if that's what you want, you're the animator, right? Um, I can also stretch this out. So if I sele select all this and I grab one of these at the end and stretch it, I can more like evenly distribute all of these keyframes to where the timing is a little more even. Now there's a problem with doing this, which is right there on frame 31. Um, you'll see that I have a keyframe. I have that key tick, right? But where I stretched it, Maya is going to stretch it sort of mathematically, right? And numbers don't always divide evenly, right? So if I, you know, if, if I scale something up, sometimes I end up with 33 and a half, right? Well, a half isn't a keyframe. So the annoying part about this is if I hit S again right there, you'll see that on frame 33, I have two keyframes. And Maya's like, wait, which one do I listen to? Which one am I paying attention to? Which keyframe is the real decision? Um, so I'm going to undo that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of that range I scaled, right click, and say snap. Okay, and when I do that, it's going to snap my keys to whole keyframes again. Right? And so now if I make a change to this, it will just copy over my old keyframe. Okay, so that's a, that is a, a problem that a lot of people run into. So now that's looking a little better. Um, to me, there's still a little bit of a timing mistake right here. It's a little bit slow going from there to there. Maybe I'll scoot that one earlier. So let's see what that looks like. There we go, that's looking better. But it still doesn't make complete sense, right? Um, I've just been moving it, like, but my arrow, like, let's think about how you walk around, right? Like, let's say you're going to go to the bathroom down here at the end of the hall, right? You're not just like walking and then you suddenly like start going diagonally toward that bathroom, right? Usually things when they're traveling kind of aim at stuff, which means I haven't really, can like this is always in the same rotation. It's always like rotated at 90 degrees, right? So I can go in here and add extra keyframes to make this look like it's sort of um, aiming, right? So maybe at the beginning here, as it starts traveling down, I would just add an extra keyframe where it's pointed down, right? And so now, it kind of points down, goes back straight, and it starts going up here, maybe like right here in the middle, I want it to point up. So I hit S again. So I'm adding more keyframes, but I'm controlling my animation more now, right? Goes back to straight. Maybe as it's coming down here, I do the same thing again. Yes. 
And then as it's coming in for a landing here, I want to kind of guide it toward its destination here. There we go. And so now when I watch this animation, it makes a little more sense. Right? Okay. It's worth um, acknowledging that this mess of red tick marks drives some people crazy. Like, they're just like, uh, I can't stand that, right? Um, and, I, and I get that. Like, it feels very unorganized. It feels like, um, it feels like you're, you're kind of forcing it to do what you want it to do, like with brute force, right? You're just like trying to, um, you know, make it fit with a hammer, right? Um, you kind of have to get over that. It takes a lot of keyframes um, to uh, to clearly define a complex motion, right? So these keyframes are your instructions, right? And just like you can't, like if you were programming something, you couldn't make a complicated action happen in a computer program with a single instruction. It takes a lot of instructions for this thing to operate correctly. Now, how many of you, this is, this is making sense? Like you, you, you feel like you're kind of getting this, right? Okay. So the exercise today is going to be for you to, to kind of um, do something similar than this. However, before I get into this, I'm going to show you this other part of Maya that's going to make your brain hurt a little bit. Okay, um, because we've been saying all along, Maya is figuring out those keyframes in between, right? It's like we, we have, you know, I defined where it should be on frame 13. Um, I, you can use your greater than, less than keys to jump from keyframe to keyframe, by the way, and that's really handy. And I defined where it was going to be on frame 21. So 13, 21, 13, 21. How does Maya figure out where it should be on frame 70, right? Um, the answer, how many of you like math? Let me, let me just ask you that first. Two people, right? Uh, I actually saw some head shakes in the room when I asked that, right? Most of you, um, I, I just ran into this a lot. Most of you like fight with math. I think most people fight with math. My personal opinion is that that happens because um, math is kind of forcibly taught and like people don't always learn at an early age that there are some actual kind of neat stuff happening in math. And like the people who get excited about it, they get excited about it. The rest of us like feel like it's a chore. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit of a disappointing statement when I tell you that the way Maya figures this out is with math. Right, um, you're not going to have to do math, but you are going to have to understand that this is about numbers. Like this, this um, when we when we create a location for this object, we're just putting numbers in the in that graph, right? And Maya can understand numbers really easily. Maya counts really well, right? Um, and so it's just doing a transition between those numbers, right? So. Um, we, we've, we've had to do this before too, right? I'm sure you all had to do this in some class, probably even in elementary school, where they were like, um, let's graph the, um, the uh, you know, your height from the age of five to the age of 10, right? Um, and like it's this theoretical, oh, at the age of five, you were, uh, well, I don't know how tall you would have been, like 60 inches, right? Um, does that seem about right? Um, but then by the time you were 10, you were, you know, 78 inches, I don't know. Um, so, and, th and at the age of seven, you were, you know, halfway between that. And you draw all these points on a graph and you connect them together, right? That's all Maya is doing with this, is it's creating a graph of these input, uh, inputs that I'm giving it, right? Whenever I move the object and hit S, I'm giving it another data point. And Maya is going to generate a graph for those data points, okay? So what, right? Like you already learned how to set keyframes, just hit S to your little heart's content. 
The problem with that is, is you'll notice that when I, when I watch this, it's a little like wonky in spots. Like it's a little jittery. Like it's got like some shaky motion, right? And if I want to make this clean, um, I could go in there and meticulously change every keyframe until it starts to clean it up. And that is possible, but our eyes are not great at, at tracking like what that little change is. Like I feel that like, something particularly here at the end doesn't feel right. It's like the rotation's like off or something. But my eyes aren't able, able, able to like pinpoint exactly what it is, right? However, our, our, our eyes are able to notice drastic changes in patterns. And when we look at a graph, if you're looking at a graph of your, you know, how, how tall you were, and you saw a weird spike right in the middle, you'd be like, wait, I must have wrote that number down wrong, right? You, you can spot like these inconsistencies in the graph. So the way we do fine control of motion after we've set all these keyframes is with a graph editor. I'm going to show you that today. If you are really like ambitious, I would encourage you to play around in there. Go ahead and save your my file first before you do. But um, and you don't have to save this one. I mean, like for the for the exercise. But when you get into that exercise, if you're really feeling like a go-getter. Hop into the graph editor and let's see what happens when you make some changes. The next project, we're going to be using the graph editor pretty heavily. Um, so let's go ahead and open it up just so you can see it. The easiest way to open it, Windows, Animation Editor, Graph Editor. So there it is. Um, another way that I usually do it in class just so you can see it better is you can also go to your workspace tabs here and choose the animation workspace. And what it usually does is it opens it up below your, um, below your viewport, right? And so then I can go back to my, um, my front view. Yeah. Now, when I click this, I get this mess of curves, right? I get all of these different graphs in here, right? And so what this is is each of these curves represents one of those channels in your channel box, right? So your translate X value, right now it's at negative um, 2.499, but if I move forward a little bit, now it's at negative 6.8, right? That's your translate X. And if I click on translate X, you'll see that there's my graph for that, right? So maybe one of the issues that I'm having is the fact that my curve does, or my, my um, arrow cone, whatever, doesn't seem to be traveling at a constant rate, right? It kind of changes a little bit there, changes a little bit toward the end. Um, the other thing I can look at, my translate Y, that is my arrows up and down, right? I think. Yeah. So this is, um, the, and if we, we go look at our translate Z, nothing is changing because that's how, like that's the depth channel. Um, and these rotations, nothing is changing until rotate. Z. So the only ones that are actually really changing at all are those three, right? This is where um, I, I, I know just from having taught this for a while, a portion of you right now are like, Ugh, I hate that. I'm never going to use that, right? This is, like, this is the biggest challenge that animators face is that you think that I'm coming, you think that you're coming in here to make something like all artsy and make it move, and then I'm like, yes, we're going to manipulate curves all day long. We're gonna adjust graphs. It sounds like I'm like, turns out you're in accountancy. This is not animation at all. We're going to, we're gonna make pie charts, right? Like that does not sound exciting to you. Again, this is a tool, right? And this is actually a very, um, a very uh, powerful, um, I love the graph editor. Yes. Um, so the way I brought it up here is I just changed my workspace to animation right down here. But you can also get it through Windows, Animation Editors, and then um, Graph Editor. So it's that top one right there. Um, I my my wife will talk about my job, and she um, says that. 
it's the most boring job in the world because how she sees it is I'm always staring at this thing, right? Like it's like it's so boring. He'll sit there forever and just like tweak little curves here and there, right? Um, and from the outside, it is. But I don't see the curve anymore, right? I'm I'm Neo from the Matrix. I stared at the screen. All that stuff flew by. And now I know kung fu, right? That's how this. This is how this will feel to you eventually, right? This curve is a visual indication of a part of that object's motion, right? And you will not, you'll stop seeing that that's a blue line and you'll start seeing that as how that object is moving. And you'll, like, I, it's, but that's sort of a hard part that people kind of fight with. Um, if animation is something you like though, I, I promise that this doesn't always seem boring. Like this actually gets very exciting and it's very powerful. Because, um, because there's a lot of things I can do to this, right? If I wanted to change the way my object is moving forward, and I'll frame that up, um, I can just shift this, right? And I can make it move forward faster in areas or slower in others. Now, because I changed where it's moving forward, it's kind of messing up there a little bit. So I kind of have to be careful with it, right? Um, but there are different things that I can do to make this animation seem a little less messed up, right? Um, if you just select a key, I can move that key, and I can change where this object's forward and backward motion is. The thing that confuses most people about this is that this curve only represents one of those channels. Right? When I'm adjusting it, I'm only adjusting the forward and backward motion on this red curve. If I want to adjust the up and down motion, I have to go to the yellow curve, right? And the way we determine that is if you look at my um, arrow that is on my cone, um, red X is side to side, yellow is pointing up and down. I can't really see the blue because it's pointing away from us, right? Um, so you'll get in the habit of that, but the only real way to figure this out is to start playing with it, right? Now, here's why I like it, um, is because let's say my art director came to me and said, you know what? We put all of those blocks in the wrong places. I'm sorry. They actually go up here, right? And I'm like, wait, but my animation's doing this. It doesn't make sense anymore, right? guess I have to start over from the beginning. I don't. Um, all I have to do is fix that curve. Right? So that's my translate Z, my up and down. Right? And you'll notice that if I move this up higher, I can get it above there again. Right? So I could go, here, go ahead and do that for each of these. Or I could just grab this entire curve, shift the entire thing up, And now my animation works again. Probably needs to go a little higher. Okay. Now I think that a lot of that like wobbliness is happening in here. So the other thing you can recognize is that I can grab each of these keyframes and move them. But when I grab them, they also get this little tangent handle, right? And I can adjust how that transition happens with that tangent handle. I think most of that wobbliness is happening because of that. Right? And I can probably do something like that. Ooh. Now, for me, just out of habit, um, you can use your regular like left click to adjust these. You can also use middle click. And if you use middle click, I can click out here and still adjust that tangent handle. That's one of the reasons I do that. Um, that's just sort of a, a practice thing, whichever one gets um, more useful for you, right? So if I think these peaks are going too high, I can scale those back. I can adjust individual parts of this. Um, all of this is very easy to control. I also kind of think this is like the rotation is a little too big, particularly like right there. So maybe I grab these, move those up. Right? I can grab the whole thing and scale it. If I hit R, I can scale this curve. 
And I can make it do something really crazy. Um, so, I'm not going to require you to figure out this graph editor. I'm telling you it's there and it's coming soon, right? For those of you who have a little bit of extra time, I would hop in there and start playing with it. Yes? The one thing I missed was simply how to turn that off. How to turn? The graph editor off. Oh, if you, you just have to select the animated object. So, if I, if I have my box selected, it's not animated, so it's empty. Um, to get it open, um, we go to Windows, Animation Editor, and Graph Editor, and that will open it up. The way I have it locked in the bottom here is under Workspace. Um, usually I was in Maya Classic. I just went to the Animation Mode. And the Graph Editor is so useful that they assume if you're animating, you're going to need it. Right? That's why it pops up in there. Again, I, I don't want to turn you against the Graph Editor. Some of you are going to recognize its value very soon. Some of you are going to dread when I even say graph editor, right? My job is to drag you kicking and screaming into this relationship that you're going to have with the graph editor. Someday, you and the graph editor are going to get matching tattoos. You're going to be BFFs. You're going to go watch Infinity War 2 with the graph editor, and you're going to be like, I love you, graph editor, and the graph editor is going to be like, I love you too. You and the graph editor are going, because it makes your life so much easier, right? Um, so don't, like, just accept it. You're going to be friends. Um, and you kind of have to get over that hurdle. Um, I, I have exercises, especially in animation fundamentals, that kind of help you get over that hurdle. The sooner you start sort of tinkering in it, the, the sooner it stops feeling as intimidating, right? So let's talk about the exercise. Um, some of you have probably, oh, hopefully you've already recognized that um, I have all the exercises already listed up here, right? Um, so if I go to content, um, actually I don't think I've put the file over there yet though. Exercises one through six. So we've done exercise two cars, exercise three flip books, exercise four gif, that's what we just finished. And here we are, exercise five, maze, okay? So um, using the file provided on the ETSU E3 network, animate the arrow successfully navigating the maze. The arrow must obey the natural laws of the universe, so no ghostly traveling through walls or anything like that. Make something move in Maya, making something move in Maya is simple. Making something move exactly the way you want it to is much harder. This exercise is practice and learning how to do that. So you'll turn in a play blast, or if you're eager, you can turn in a rendered MP4 um, of the full animation. And of course, this is a pass-fail uh, project. So let's look at the timeline, and I'll go ahead and give you a due date here. So we are here, Wednesday the 26th. It'll be due on Monday, which is October 1st. So we'll do... Monday, October 1st. Um, now, what maze are you talking about, Greg? Um, POA, resources, I haven't put it in here yet. So let me go ahead and get that for you really quick. The IGM faculty, Marlowe projects, POA. You get to see behind the scenes. Look at this maze. Let me make sure. So under Greg, POA, resources, paste that in there. Copy that whole fo folder. Before you get all eager, do not go in here to scenes and just double click on maze, okay? Um, because if you do, then you're gonna lock that file for everybody else in class and everybody's gonna get mad at you and just don't do it. Like copy the maze folder to your desktop or to your hard drive, right? It should be small. File, before you do anything, file, and you're going to set your project down here at the bottom, set project, and then click on the maze folder and hit set. 
That's telling Maya where to save all of your images, where to pull all of your files from. So now when I go File, Open Scene, it takes me straight to the maze.mb file. Okay? It don't save on that thing. I don't really care about that. This is what you get. Okay? And you'll see that there's no animation. You have to make this maze event or this arrow eventually get to the exit. Okay? How you get it there is up to you. If, if you want to take it on some wrong turns, if you want to have it encounter some monsters, um, whatever. It should render pretty well, just as it is, and hopefully relatively fast. If we go to Arnold, open Arnold Render View and hit play, this is what you're going to get. And so about five seconds, getting a little bit of grain in there. If you want to get rid of some of that grain, you would just turn up the sampling on um, on these two lights right here. So you turn those samples up to like say three. It's already three on that one, oh, and three. Right. And you'll get a little bit of a better render. It'll just be a little bit more of a render time. You shouldn't have any issues rendering this, but just in case, I'll let you turn it in as a play blast because it's an exercise. Um, having said that, a lot of people are happy with the results of this one, and they like to, to show it off. So feel free to render it. It's more practice in that rendering process. So whatever you want to do with it, take it to this maze in whatever way you want to. The only real st uh, stipulation is you can't make it do something impossible. Right? You can't make, I mean, I know it's a, moving arrow, which is already impossible, right? You can't make it like, you know, um, cut through a corner of a wall or something like that, right? Unless you explain that in some way. Um, we've had people before who made them like try to jump over walls or they made extra walls come in and get, you know, trapped in a box and it gets all panicky, right? Um, you run wild with this, like have fun with this. You get a little bit of extra time on it because we have Friday as well um, as work time. Um, and we'll look at this on Monday. Any, any questions about the project? Any questions about anything we've gone over today? All right, y'all, um, I'm, I'm done. You're welcome to hang out until the uh, end of class, um, which apparently is about 20 minutes away because my phone is dinging. Um, sorry, interesting email. So, um, Whatever, whatever questions you have, feel free to hang around and ask. I'll go ahead and stop the video, upload this to YouTube. Um, because I'm sure you're going to have a lot of animation questions. How did you shift that keyframe? How do you delete a keyframe? All of that's in this video. First stop to answer those questions is probably this video. Yes? All right. Screw-ups mean that you have an opportunity to learn. So um, I'll be there in just one second. Let me go ahead and stop this video and, and upload it really quick.